is this notion that no problem should ever have to be solved twice. So the greatest virtue of being a programmer is curiosity, and then the close second is laziness. And <laughs> laziness is something that you definitely are told as a programmer. Um, and third kind of goes along with the second, is that boredom and drudgery are evil. There is no point to doing something that bores you. The whole reason that we you know, spend hours and hours in front of a computer uh, you know, getting carpal tunnel syndrome and uh, eye strain is because we enjoy it. If it's not fun, it's not worth doing. And that's, that's what it means to be a hacker. But the fourth is that freedom is good. Uh, we believe very strongly in freedom of expression, freedom of information, uh, liberty, basically. But also in the other sense, uh, if you're going to kind of look at the other sense of free as in free of charge, we give away a lot of what we do, you know, free of charge. We have an operating system, Linux, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of hours were put into that for no charge, um, and people are just doing it for fun. And it creates wealth and, and a lot of good things in the world. The way that we organize as hackers is as a gift culture. Your rank in it is not how good you are necessarily. It's not necessarily like who you are either, because who you are is what you give back. And it's a really interesting idea. It's, it's, a, it's a cool thing. And the fifth, it kind of goes along with that, is that attitude is no subst uh, substitute for competence. There's nothing to hide behind as a hacker. There's your source code. It's it's one of the most transparent mediums. Mediums because if you release your source code back into the world, you know everything is laid bare. All the mistakes you made, all the weird logic that you might have. I mean, we're really good at figuring that stuff out too. We can see it. So you can't hide behind uh, kind of claims of being good. You just have to be able to show it. So those are kind of the five attitudes to define what it means to be a hacker. Um, yeah, that's that's I'm. I'm Really happy to be able to unravel that because if I tell people I'm a hacker, people like can't take a second glance. It's nice to know that I'm not you know, going to be arrested anytime soon. Um, anyway, so that's who we are. Uh, how we work uh, is, I guess, the meat of this. Yes. One of the things it's become mainstream now. Um, mm -hmm. Remember in Chicago when they put R H O K around it, hacks of kindness up on all of the skyscrapers in Chicago. Mm -hmm. People are driving to work. What the hell does that mean? Yeah. Go home and search on it. So it's gone mainstream. Yeah, we've gone, we've got mainstream. Um, oh no. Yeah. Um, it's still, it's still cool. I promise. Um, anyway, so I guess the bulk of this is I'm going to explain how uh, a programmer approaches this kind of work. And this, uh, I know a lot of you are programmers. Uh, if this isn't new information for you, I think maybe having it heard articulated in a way it will maybe help you get start to think of how you might explain it to other people because, uh, I mean, we can do really cool things, but often it's, it's a lot cooler if we work with people outside of our sphere. So that's what you should keep in mind. Um, so anyway, if we're going to think about tackling a problem, uh, just a general construct, of, uh, we have an input, some sort of raw material that we're going to work with, in our case it's going to be information, uh, and a process, things, ways that we're going to manipulate that data in, into other forms of information. And then the output is the way that we present it. And if you want to get fancy, I guess you can chain those together so the output becomes the input for something else. Um, so this is the way, those are the kind of three parts of how we think through a process. And we're just going to talk through uh, those three really quick. So the first section is input. And when we talk about input, we're talking about information. And when we talk about computers and information, we're talking about data. And you can express data very simply. There, there's like only a handful of different kinds of data out there, if you think about it. And that's what we call the data primitives. They're numbers, strings, so that's any form of text, uh, dates, so that's a calendar date or a time of day, basically a timestamp whenever something happened. Uh, we have booleans, which uh, things can either be true or false, or it's closely related to cousin in a numerated value, you know. Uh, where you have a small closed set of possibilities, like cardinal directions, those aren't going to change. Or like, yeah, you know, genders. Like something that's a small closed set where you choose one or the other, that's, that's a possibility. And then lastly, an association. Things can be interrelated to each other. So those are the data primitives. If you think of any piece of information that you want to model, that's all you have to work with. And it's more than enough in a lot of cases. So just kind of take that in. That's how we're starting to think about the problem. Whenever we think about what we're going to model information-wise, we look at that and we start to kind of piece it to, you know, sort of taking things apart and seeing where they fit in. So, for, I mean, case in point, if we're thinking about a person, they have a name, that's a string. Uh, they have a birthday, that's a date, obviously. Uh, a height is a number, and I guess the units would be implied there. Um, sex, you know, 
and whether or not they're married, that's a, that's a boolean. So like that's just a basic example of how you might break down a person into their component primitives. So that's, that's just a way to think about it. But if we want to actually do anything with this form, or with this information, that was an abstract schema. We need to translate it into a format. We need to uh, translate it into something we can use. So a format <coughs> is a set of conventions that's used to translate in from bits into ideas uh, back and forth. So we need to encode this information somehow. And whenever we talk about formats, uh, there are three main formats I want to cover. Uh, we have CSV, comma separated values, so things are delimited by commas. Uh, XML, which looks like that with the angle brackets, looks a lot like HTML. And uh, JSON, uh, curly brackets. And each one has advantages and disadvantages. Um, to touch on this, this is what CSV looks like. How many people have everybody seen CSV, right? <laughs> cool. Um, it can be a mess. I mean, it's data, and it's just flat like that. It's So by convention, the first row is going to be kind of the keys for all of the different um, types of fields there. And if you want to think about it, uh, columns are delim delimited by uh, commas, or tabs, if it's tab separated value. And then new lines kind of delimit rows. So all that data is kind of available to you as if it were a spreadsheet. In fact, if you copy paste from an Excel spreadsheet, I, I think it's tab separated values that would get out. That's very, it's a very common way of expressing a lot of data. It's a simple way of doing it. Unfortunately, it's not really my favorite way of handling data because it's very prone to uh, corruption. If you lose that top row, you don't know what the hell the data is going to be anymore. Um, it also doesn't really encapsulate the relationships between the different pieces of data. So it's a good way to dump data in one place, but certainly not the optimal one, at least for uh, a lot of purposes. The second one to look at is XML. Um, should be pretty familiar to people. It's, uh, you have structured data now. So you see that there's a person element, and set, as a part of that person you have an address, phone numbers. Um, each tag has attributes that has so those are met pieces of metadata for that person, and you can show the relationships. I think the, the rule sets are pretty simple. In fact, you can formalize them into namespaces, so you can have your document validated. So you can set rules for what can go inside other things. But normally, for other for most purposes, that's overkill, and there's it's not really needed because you're not going to be using this format uh, you know, very consistently. For a lot of cases, like. Sure, the, the formality makes sense, but if you're going to be writing an API yourself, uh, XML, uh, people aren't really looking for XML uh, these days either as far as web APIs. What they're really looking for is the new hot as well, not really not new. Uh, JSON, uh, which is, so it stands for JavaScript uh, object notation. It's a lot close, so this is the way that you would encode something in JavaScript itself. You have curly brackets, it still shows the relations of data to other things. It's just a lot simpler. It's a lot more lightweight, um, and that's generally what you see whenever we're going to be working with uh, web APIs. So, talking about web APIs. Um, web APIs are what you talk to in order to get information. So we have uh, a defined set of HTTP requests that you're going to send to a service in order to get data back. And a lot of times you're going to get it back in JSON. All the websites you, you know and love and want to get information from have web APIs. Um, and that's what you, how you're going to get at the information. Uh, if we're going to be talking about APIs, we need to talk about REST, which stands for representational, uh, representational state transfer. Um, that's just a fancy way of saying that we are going to call a verb on a noun. And it's just a standard way of calling web services that makes sense so that there's a convention that's followed uh, across other uh, web services. In HTTP, the hypertext uh, transfer protocol, uh, you have four verbs. Uh, you should all know get and post if you know, you've used an internet browser. The difference between get and post is that get parameters are in the URL, whereas post is sent. Like if you're submitting a form, you don't see the parameters. Those are sent in the background in the body of the request. Um, you're probably not as familiar with put or delete because web browsers don't really support them, which is a shame because they're really cool and obscure. But that might be the hipster in me. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Right, and how we use them is, is as such. So we're going to send a get request to this URL, so api.twitter.com. One is the version number for the API. Status is, is the resource that we're looking at. They have show there. It doesn't really need to be there. It's not very restful, but whatever. This is the API. And then the ID, uh, .json. And that will give us uh, this. So this is JSON. As you can see, the, da the data is uh, numbers, <coughs> dates, and strings. And this gives us back a tweet with all of its fields. So that corresponds to that. 
which is, I don't know, I think it's pretty funny. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, every time that you use a Twitter client, that's using the Twitter API. All of the clients you've ever used, anything that interacts with this data, they're all working with these APIs. So, I mean, knowing this stuff allows you to pretty much consume that information and present it however you want, uh, whether that's on your website and visualization, or maybe in a tool that you create for yourself. So that's all the input stuff. Any, any questions? Cool. All right, so process. And whenever you think about process, you might want to start jump right into programming. But before we do that, we need to consider rule number two of the hacker ethos, the attitude, is that no problem should ever have to be solved twice. Um, a lot of people, whenever they see a problem, is that they get right to coding, they start imagining how they're going to model things and how they're going to do it. You gotta show some restraint though, because it, there are so many people that have approached very similar problems that it's very likely that people have already solved this for you. And that's, that's great, that's time saved and you know, getting towards what you actually want to accomplish. So the general process of what you should do is first look around, you know, go on Google, see what people have done, and see what kind of solutions are out there. And if you find anything, that's cool. Um, if you if it suits your purpose, but purposes perfectly, use them. If they don't, see if you can adapt them. See if you can configure them. See if you can jerry rig something together with minimal effort to make sure that it works. That that's that's great. But if you can't, and you really do need to roll your own uh, roll your own solution, uh, use that as a last resort. But uh, having done so, like doing the research, that allows you to really understand uh, how you should approach the problem. Frameworks are a set of libraries that sit on top of the language. Uh, so it's designed to solve a very specific problem very well. Languages uh, can solve any problem. They have this interesting property called Turing completeness, which means that any language, if it's Turing complete, can basically do any other set of operations that uh, another uh, language can do. So it can simulate a computer, thus it can pretty much do anything. That's cool. Frameworks um, make the language particularly well designed to a certain kind of problem, like being a web, uh, building a web application. So, for example, uh, Ruby is a language, and Rails is a framework. JavaScript is a language, <coughs> and uh, jQuery is the framework. So that's, yeah, you'll learn a lot of running points with hackers if you know that. <laughs> anyway, so Ruby. It's uh, object-oriented, it reads like English. That's pretty neat. Um, it's simple, so if you're trying to write a Twitter, if you want to post a tweet, it's as simple as uh, kind of interacting with objects like that. It looks pretty nice. Um, iterate through uh, client.friends timeline, so each you're going to pass in a tweet, and then you're going to put the tweet of the text. That's, it's, it's nice. Uh, Rails, uh, as far as frameworks go, we, we probably all know about Rails, or at least heard of Rails. That's a web application framework, good if you're making kind of a a larger application. Uh, the one that you probably haven't heard of is Sinatra, which is kind of a new love of mine, which is good for making smaller applications. If you're making a smaller info information visualization piece and need to drive data, um, check out Sinatra. It's not a, not a bad thing to look at. In fact, it's so cool that you can fit an entire Sinatra application in one slide, um, <laughs> send a get request to that URL, and say hello world. So imagine that, that kind of directness uh, and spitting out data, like that's that's the potential you have with that. So anyway, that's kind of part of the survey of what's available. Um, now it's probably a good time to talk about databases. Uh, databases are applications that manage the transfer of uh, information, so you can store and retrieve information in a structured way um, for your application. Uh, there are two kind of varieties. There's uh, relational, and so there's Postgres, uh, MySQL, and SQLite, um, as the names would imply. Uh, they you can call and retrieve, or you store and retrieve information using SQL. Um, so it's this kind of code that you're looking at, where you're going to select all the fields from your users table uh, on these conditions and order by created at uh, limit to 50 results. That's what it looks like for SQL. Uh, but lately, there's been a lot of new entries uh, in the non-relational space. Uh, these are all the NoSQL players. So you have Mongo, Redis, uh, React, and Cassandra. Um, and their query language looks a lot more like JavaScript. This does the exact same thing. Is this is just what it looks like in MongoDB. And there's a temptation, because this is a new hotness, to introduce this to your product projects, um, just because you know about it. Yeah, just generally, like, I have yet to see somebody who's really excited about using this kind of stuff, and um, they, would not, they would not be better serviced by just using a regular relational database. So this is cool to play around with, but if you're pitching this to a programmer, uh, just at least have some restraint in uh, pitching this as part of like why you're excited to do something. Um, so, um, yeah, so 
Right. The other language uh, that I find to be really important with the web is JavaScript, obviously. JavaScript is the way that you manipulate things on a page after it's loaded. Um, we've all used the internet. We all know what web pages do and how you interact with things. So don't need too many examples of that. Um, but OK, so we have frameworks uh, like jQuery. And we also have a lot of other options that do pretty much the same thing. If you're going to work with JavaScript and you're going to interact with things on a page, use a framework. Uh, there's no reason to, uh, unless you like pain, uh, not to use one of these things. So these are all great frameworks, and they all do kind of the same thing.